Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The caulk nuvolite is used to activate the adhesive materials Nuvaseal and Nuvafil. The major clinical advantage of an ultraviolet light activated material is that the operator has complete control over the working time. These adhesive materials will start only to polymerize when they're exposed to ultraviolet light of the correct wavelength. When the Nuva unit is switched on, the humming sound you will hear is created by a fan. This fan blows cool air through this grid and the air cools the ultraviolet bulb after it's been used. Whenever the light is not being used, it must be switched off and the gun replaced over the grid. This procedure will greatly extend the life of the ultraviolet bulb. To actually activate the ultraviolet light, move the paddle switch in a clockwise direction. If the bulb is active, ultraviolet light will be clearly visible at the tip of the quartz rod. To switch off the light, shift the switch in the opposite direction. The unit is designed to be used in any area of the mouth, and to facilitate access, the quartz rod can be rotated through 360 degrees. This allows ultraviolet light to be directly focused on the adhesive. When you have finished activating the adhesive, switch off the ultraviolet light and replace the gun over the cooling grid. The NuvaFill and NuvaSeal are now conveniently provided in a single kit, together with a tooth conditioner shade guide, mixing pad, brushes, brush handles, and a bottle of brush cleaner. When you open the kit, the first item you will notice is this metal container labeled tooth conditioner which is actually a euphemism for 50% phosphoric acid solution. This is the enamel etching solution which is used to increase the available surface area of enamel and in so doing provides mechanical retention for the adhesive. There is 10 mil of this solution in a plastic squeeze bottle. When you're ready to etch the enamel, squeeze out a few drops of etchant into a Daffin's jar. Acid is applied to a localized area of enamel with a small brush. There are three small brushes in the kit and they are found in this small plastic container. The kit also contains two metal brush handles. Slip one of the brushes onto a handle and use this to apply the acid. Do not use the brush for any other material. To control the flow of the acid, apply only a small amount at a time. The shade guide has four shades to choose from. Yellow, light yellow, light gray, and light. The shade guide is used to select the shade of Nuvafil, which will most closely match the color of the abutment teeth. Under the shade guide there is a small mixing pad. There are four plastic syringes, each containing a different shade of Nuvafil. This material is pre-mixed and pre-activated and the different shades may be mixed together to create an accurate color match. To dispense the Nuvafil, remove the cap and gently squeeze out a small amount onto the mixing pad. Also included in the kit are three bottles of Nuvaseal. This is the low viscosity unfilled bis GMA resin, which is generally used as a fissure sealant, but in this case it is used as an intermediary resin before applying the Nuvafil. The brown bottles are impervious to ultraviolet light, 
and this prevents premature polymerization by naturally occurring ultraviolet light. With a second brush, place a drop of the NuvaSeal onto the mixing pad. The manufacturers claim that if properly stored in a refrigerator, the material will have a shelf life of at least 12 months. To check that the material is still satisfactory, do a trial exposure. Switch on the Nuva light and expose the Nuva fill and Nuva seal for 20 seconds. If the materials have not deteriorated and are still active, they should set with this exposure. Replace the gun over the fan and switch off the ultraviolet light and then switch off the fan. Test the set of the NuvaFill and NuvaSeal. Both materials should have set hard. At the end of each procedure, the brush used to apply the Nuva seal must be cleaned or the sealant will polymerize and the brush will be useless. The final item in the kit is a bottle of brush cleaner, ethyl acetate, which is a solvent for the unpolymerized resin. Dip the brush into the cleaner and give a few twirls. The ethyl acetate is highly volatile and to conserve it, replace the cap immediately. Then wipe the brush clean on a gauze square. The only tooth that our patient is missing is the upper right central incisor, and this tooth has been replaced with a flipper. There is a diastema between the lateral incisor and the central incisor. In the natural dentition, there was probably a midline diastema. The upper and lower incisors do not contact in central occlusion, but there is contact in protrusion. Remove the denture and note that the abutment teeth are caries free and have no restorations. The first task is to select a shade for the pontic. For this patient, a BioBlend shade 106 closely matches the abutment teeth. To aid in the selection of an appropriate mold of denture tooth and to then contour this tooth, we require upper and lower casts mounted on an articulator. So at the first visit, take full upper and lower alginate impressions. These impressions are poured up in stone and the trimmed casts are mounted in centric occlusion on a simple articulator. The casts have been mounted on a simple articulator in centric occlusion. When we examine the casts, note that there is no contact between the upper and lower incisors. There is a decided advantage as there will be adequate space on the palatal surface of the lateral and central incisor for the nuva fill. And there will be no question of interfering with occlusal function. From a range of acrylic denture teeth, shade 106, select a central incisor which most closely conforms to the space which is available. Invariably, some contouring of the denture tooth is needed. Start contouring with a large acrylic trimming burr. Do this carefully with frequent referral back to the cast. Continue trimming until nearly complete. To aid in the final stages of contouring, mark the ridge area liberally with a lead pencil. 
This will help indicate areas of contact. Now position and rub the pottic over the ridge. Areas of contact will be clearly marked and these can be adjusted further. At this stage, the tooth is well adapted to the ridge, but it's too long incisally. Reduce and contour the incisal edge. The contouring of the pontic is completed, and it blends in with the existing dentition. Minor adjustments are made when the pontic is tried in the mouth. Examine the trimmed pontic in more detail and note that the position and contour of the gingival area closely conforms to the other central incisor. The incisal edges are even and there is adequate space for the interdental papillae, both mesially and distally. There is also good contouring on the palatal. In centric occlusion, once again, there is no contact between the pontic and the lower incisors, nor between the natural incisors. Mechanical retention is now cut into the pontic, and this is first illustrated on a large plaster tube. Divide the palatal surface of the crown into thirds. Now extend the dividing lines onto the approximal surface. A vertical line further divides this surface into a buccal third and a palatal two thirds. In this box, a class three cavity outline is then drawn. On the mesial with the palatal isthmus in the middle zone, which will join another class three cavity outline distally. On the prepared model, there is an undercut palatal isthmus which joins the class three cavities. This does not undermine the incisal edge, nor does it extend too far buccally, and there is a good dovetail. Additional undercut is now placed in the incisal area, but gingivally as it is shown on the distal surface. The deep undercut is cut in the bulkiest portion of the pontic. The first area prepared is the palatal isthmus, and this is done with an inverted cone burr. Cut to the full depth of the burr. Once this is completed, continue and prepare the mesial and distal class three cavities. Use the same burr and cut to the same depth. The final preparation is the deep gingival undercut, which is prepared with a round burr. The undercut areas are completed. Now, take a close look at the pontic. The palatal isthmus is limited to the middle third of the tooth. It is narrow, 
but deep. The class three cavity does not undermine the incisal edge and it extends into the gingival third and in this area there is the additional undercut. The same basic preparation is seen on the opposite side. The pontic is now ready to be tried in the mouth. Remove the flipper and try in the prepared pontic. Check the shade match, the contouring, and the occlusion. Take special note of the buccopalatal and incisal edge relationships of the pontic with the abutment teeth before placing the rubber dam. Note the midline diastema. It is important to maintain a clean, dry field whenever you use the acid etch technique. Whenever possible, an acid etch bridge should be placed using a rubber dam. Place the dam over all the anterior teeth and extend it to include at least the first bicuspids. This will provide adequate access. With the dam in place, retry the pontic and confirm that the pontic can be positioned in the same way as it was before the dam was placed. With a creamy mix of flour of pumice and water in a rubber cup, carefully polish the abutment teeth to remove any plaque. Proprietary polishing or prophylaxis paste should not be used as they contain agents such as glycerin which interferes with the acid etching. Wash off the residual paste with a copious stream of water and then air dry the teeth. The acid etchant is painted on the abutment teeth with a small brush. Be careful and only etch the enamel needed for retention. Keep the teeth moist for one and a half minutes. Wash and dry the teeth. There should be definite visible signs of etching. The enamel on the abutment should have lost their surface gloss and the teeth should have a distinct ground glass appearance. If this is not the case, re-etch for another minute. A thin layer of Nuvasil is now painted on the abutment teeth. Cover half the buckle and also the mesial and distal surfaces. With the ultraviolet light, expose each surface for 20 seconds. If we were to position the pontic in the mouth at this stage, the ultraviolet light would have no access to the deep undercut areas. These inaccessible areas are filled out of the mouth with small increments of nuvafil.
after each increment directly exposed to the ultraviolet light. Polymerization is checked with a sharp explorer. Before insertion, a small amount of nubaceal is painted on the mesial and distal surfaces of the pontic. The pontic is carefully positioned in the mouth in the same position we determined earlier. Each joint is exposed to the ultraviolet light. Both joints are exposed from the buckle and also from the palatal. Once stabilized, check the positioning of the pontic. Make sure that the distal and mesial contacts are properly aligned, that the incisal edges are level, and that the gingival position is correct. If wrongly positioned, it is a simple matter to remove the pontic and reposition. When correctly positioned, the pontic is locked into place with NuvaFill. With unlimited working time, contour the NuvaFill as desired. And only then expose to the ultraviolet light. Once again, small increments are placed and then polymerized. Periodically check that the material is fully cured. On the palatal surface, extend the nubifil over as large an area as possible. This will help increase retention. Finally, with an explorer, check that all the nubifil has set hard. The insertion is complete. Remember, before attempting to remove the rubber dam, to cut through the section under the pontic. And also through the other interdental areas. When the rubber dam is removed, check that there is adequate space for the interdental papillae. Also check that the gingival and interdental contours are correct. The same area should also be checked on the palatal.
The final step is to adjust the occlusion. Have the patient open. Tap a few times. Slide forward and slide back. Ideally, there should be no occlusal contact on the pontic. Areas of contact are adjusted out until finally contact is limited to the adjacent teeth. Use small burrs to adjust out contact areas. This is the occlusal marking and protrusion after final adjustment. Again, have the patient close, tap a few times, slide forward, and slide back. Both central incisors are missing in this patient, and they'll be replaced with an acid etch bridge. With the maxillary cast as a guide, select appropriate denture teeth to replace the missing central incisors. The chosen central is the correct width, but is obviously too long and needs to be shortened. To aid in the contouring, mark the residual ridge area with a lead pencil. Start the contouring of the tooth at the gingival end with a large acrylic trimming burr. In the final stages, mark areas of contact by rubbing the tooth lightly against the ridge. Areas of contact will be clearly marked and these areas are adjusted. The incisor has been shortened and contoured. At this stage, check the contour and gingival relationship and also the positioning of the distal contact. Once both centrals have been trimmed and correctly positioned on the cast, carefully wax out any spaces interproximally and gingivally. This is done on both buccal and palatal surfaces. This will prevent the teeth being locked in the plaster index. To prevent the plaster from flowing all over the model, Construct a dam around the anterior teeth with red rope wax. Start one tooth beyond the abutment teeth and place a strip on each side. Now place a third strip on the palatal to complete the dam.
A separating medium, COSEP tinfoil substitute, is then painted over the dam area to prevent plaster sticking to the cast. Only apply a thin layer. Make a creamy mix of quick setting impression plaster. Carefully vibrate this plaster into the dam area. Try not to trap air bubbles and place enough to provide a solid index. Once the plaster has set hard, lever the index off with a plaster knife. If a separating medium was used, the index should come away from the cast in one piece. Check that there is an accurate impression of the denture teeth and that there are no bubbles. Also check that the denture teeth can be accurately repositioned in the index. Now trim the index and clean the teeth. The index, when trimmed, still extends over a tooth on both the right and the left sides. The plaster fingers that extend over the palatal surface stabilize the index. All the wax is cleaned off the teeth and they're maintained in the position by the index. To join the pottocks, first cut an isthmus in the middle third of the palatal surface, two-thirds across the tooth. Cut this area with a small inverted cone burr. Now on the mesial surface, cut a class three cavity with the same inverted cone burr, and then cut a deep undercut gingively with a round burr. With both teeth prepared in this way and positioned on the index, it would be impossible to fill the mesial surfaces. If we remove the tooth, you can see why the area would be inaccessible. So we filled the deep undercut areas with NuvaFill with the tooth out of the index. And get direct exposure with the ultraviolet light. To ensure polymerization, add small increments. When partially filled and polymerized, replace the teeth in the index and complete the link up with NuvaFill. Carefully condense and contour and continue to cure small increments at a time. The centrals are linked 
and can now be inserted as a single unit. Careful contouring in the midline will create the illusion of two individual teeth. Mechanical retention in the form of a class three cavity is cut mesially and extended palatally. The same is done distally. With the linked pontics back on the model, check that there is adequate room for the interdental papillae, that the incisal contour blends with the natural teeth. This is the patient with a bridge in place. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.